Chimin que golpea de Vietnam a toda la humanidad. Ningún cañón borrará el surco de tu arrozal, el derecho de vivir en paz. Indochina es el lugar más allá del ancho mar donde revientan la sol con genocidio y napal la luna es una explosión que funde todo el clamor el derecho de vivir en Tanto universal, cadena que hará triunfar el derecho de vivir en paz. La 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 es el canto universal, cadena que hará triunfar el derecho de vivir en paz. Welcome, friends and comrades, to another interview hosted by the Midwestern Marx Institute for Marxist Theory and Political Analysis. You just heard El Derecho de Vivir en Paz, a 1971 song by the socialist Chilean singer Victor Jara, which was dedicated to Ho Chi Minh and the heroic struggles of the Vietnamese people against imperialism. The song sets the tune nicely for today's conversation on Ho Chi Minh, the new Cold War on Russia and China, and the developments of a new pink wave in Latin America all of which will be discussed with our wonderful guest, Comrade Vijay Prashad, whom we will now introduce. Vijay Prashad is an Indian historian, editor, and journalist. He is the chief editor of Leftward Books and the director of the Tricontinental Institute for Social Research. He is a senior non-resident fellow at the Changyang Institute for Financial Studies in Renmin University of China. He has written more than 20 books, including The Darker Nations, um, the Poorer Nations. Um, his latest book is Washington Bullets, which comes with um, an introduction by Evo Morales. Um, and he is also the editor of the recently published Selected Ho Chi Minh and the co-author with Noam Chomsky of The Withdrawal. So thank you for being with us today, Vijay. Wonderful. Um, we can get started with our first question with that. Um, as Eddie mentioned, you recently edited and introduced Selected Ho Chi Minh. One of the things you have always emphasized uh, is the artificial binary a lot of the Western left uses to think about the developments of Marxism. For instance, in the West is where the theory develops out of, and in the East, it is where it gets applied. Here we have a schism splitting theory and praxis from each other. Besides the exception of Mao and Maoism, which was incorporated into French and academic intellectual circles in the 60s and 70s, this somewhat chauvinistic divide generally represents the way revolutionary leaders and theorists like Ho Chi Minh are viewed in the West. Our question is, why do you think the Western left holds so tightly to the split between theorist and practitioner, 
Why are the theoretical contributions of figures like Ho Chi Minh overlooked? What theoretical insights does Ho's unique application and development of Marxism-Leninism for Vietnam provide? And what can American communists learn from these? Uh, it's great to be with you. Uh, it's terrific that you have a Marxism Institute, which is called Midwestern. Uh, that's a terrific development. Um, and I'm really happy that you're also publishing books. Uh, that pleases me a lot. Um, in fact, your question takes us back to the early part of, uh, of communist history. Because when the Soviet Republic was established after the revolution of 1917, and then, you know, when the USSR is created, um, the failure of revolutionary developments in Western Europe, including in, the, in its eastern flank, the failure of the Hungarian Revolution, then the failure of the German Revolution and so on, created a kind of disillusionment among Marxist writers and thinkers in the West. Now, very interesting, they could very well have then turned their attention to start theorizing a couple of things. One is how to build a revolution in their society, um, and the other, how to understand the actually uh, developing process of socialist construction in, say, the Soviet uh, Union, and then subsequently in Vietnam after 1945, in China after 1949, in Cuba after 1959, and so on. Um, these could have been two serious research uh, agendas. You know, one, uh, why is the revolution not taking place in, um, in Western Europe, in the United States, and so on? And secondly, uh, how are they constructing socialism, and what are some examples for that? But in fact, this was not the research agenda, Carlos, and that's a key issue. The research agenda becomes uh, in twofold. One is it adopts pessimism and starts to regard um, the impossibility of, of communism to be established as, as a point of, of, of theoretical consideration. And here you have, for instance, you know, the, the elements of the Frankfurt School, which become quite dominant. Uh, here you have a very large section of Marxism, which retreats to philosophy, uh, goes into questions of, of what are people, what is social being, and so on. Uh, but it's not asking the question, how do we transcend the wretchedness of the system? So one is this sort of pessimistic retreat into theory or into, um, into philosophy. Uh, this retreat into theory uh, begins to become quite sophisticated, but it's not engaging with the actual tradition and practice of building socialism. The second thing that happens in the West is you get a certain kind of reflection of what's taking place in the Soviet Union, what's taking place in China and so on. And this becomes a kind of, uh, you know, a critique of those experiments without trying to understand that they were trying to build socialism in the realm of necessity, not in the realm of freedom. You know, these were often colonized places with a great deal of poverty and so on. So you, you start getting a kind of, of, you know, arrogant assessment of socialism in these countries rather than trying to accompany these movements to see what is possible, what is the actual movement of history and so on. And I think this is the reason why you start getting a block in the West and you start to not think of um, a Ho Chi Minh as a serious a theorist. He's seen as merely somebody who led a revolution or merely somebody who built a state. It's a very arrogant approach, um, you know, not looking at how was Ho Chi Minh theorizing the revolutionary process in his time? How was Mao uh, theorizing the difficulty of building socialism? Not abstracting from Mao a theory of armed struggle, you know, which is what uh, most becomes fashionable. But in fact, how is Mao trying to understand and how are Maoists and others in China trying to understand the difficult prospect of building socialism, how to accompany the socialist process. And I think that's the reason why Ho Chi Minh is disparaged. If I were to lay out a research agenda today for Marxists in, say, the United States or in other parts of the West, I would return to 100 years ago the possibilities that were there, you know, to write about why it is that the working class, um, you know, is caught in a fog of ideology, is unable to actually advance to a 
different kind of political assessment of the situation. Why is that? We need uh, empirical studies. We need deep understanding of the culture and the, the, the kind of uh, grip that the political class has on the population. And also we need to have people go and accompany movements today in Cuba and Venezuela and so on, try to learn how are people actually trying to build socialism in very difficult circumstances. Go and look and see what's happening in Kerala. Accompany the movements. Try to understand and abstract from those movements elements of theory. All of that is simply not done. What's done today is exactly what happened 100 years ago. A pessimistic retreat into philosophy and then a disparagement of socialist experiments uh, in different parts of the world. Wow, thank you so much for that answer. It actually leads very neatly into my next question, especially when you talk about the retreat into philosophy, which was, you know, began with the Frankfurt School, really. And how much uh, I think it's important to remember how much our capitalist class here pushed that and the creation of a compatible left that really existed only to criticize everything around them rather than build something of their own. Uh, at Midwestern Marx, we often talk about how in the West, we seem to have ignored the 11th thesis on Forbach or misunderstood it when we don't ignore it. Anyway, it leads me to my question, which is uh, with the current new Cold War against China and Russia ramping up, there's so much misinformation flying around us and more not real socialisms than I've ever been able to shake any number of sticks at. One of my favorite things you've ever said was that you're a lot more interested in what Chinese Marxists think of Chinese socialism. So really, my question is, what do Chinese Marxists think of Chinese socialism? Uh, do you know what the general debates in China are going on right now? And how can we non-Chinese learn about them? Well, firstly, I should say that I didn't mean that in a way that non-Chinese Marxists must not look at what's going on. But it's interesting to also look at what Chinese, what the Chinese debates are. So a few years ago, uh, before Xi Jinping um, was elected to be the head of the Chinese party, um, a leading Chinese Marxist intellectual by the name of Chen Enfu came to India, came to Kerala and delivered a very important lecture where he tried to map out the nine different dominant schools of thought in China. You know, Noah, you might be surprised to learn that most of those schools of thought were not Marxist. They were even Jeffersonian liberals. They were neoliberals. They were liberals and so on and so forth. You know, one variant of liberal after the other. Uh, liberal, of course, being an extraordinarily wide a ranging term doesn't capture the essence of what's being talked about because after all, a neoliberal is hardly liberal in any respect. You know, they are willing to use terrible force against people to exercise their agenda. Uh, I just saw former Treasury Secretary Lawrence Summers sent out a tweet saying essentially that people in the United States need to have their living standards drop um, in order for capitalism to be saved. Now, I also agree that uh, there needs to be some measure of changes in, in the consumption patterns, but not of the average person in the United States. We're talking about the billionaire class needs to change their consumption patterns. But that's a separate question. The principal point I want to raise here is this point about, you know, um, you've got to uh, get a sense, I suppose, uh, that there are these debates in China where a large section of people are coming from a liberal standpoint. Well, then you've got Maoists, you've got orthodox Marxists, you've got what Chen Enpu says he is, which is a creative Marxist. And frankly, um, who doesn't want to be a creative Marxist? So the person that did the mapping exercise says that he's a creative Marxist and the others not so creative and so on. There are a range of opinions. I mean, Xi Jinping, for instance, has been uh, you know, the leader of the Communist Party of China uh, where there are 96 million people in that party. And now you can't, unless you have a racist attitude toward the Chinese people, you can't assume that all 96 million agree on the same thing. 
and that they march in lockstep. Not true at all. There are fierce disagreements inside the Communist Party. Um, there are some people who believe that there should be greater um, you know, privatization in order to accelerate growth in China. They have accepted, let's say, the strictures of neoliberalism. And some of these people are, are senior party members. In fact, they control um, important institutions in China. You go to most of the universities, these people exist. Then there is a debate among Marxists about, you know, how much, um, you know, you need to have uh, uh, public enterprises, how much public enterprises should be brought back to the center of the economy, uh, whether you're going to create, um, you know, er eradicate poverty by, um, by social transfer wages, that means creating public goods, or you're going to just create transfer wages by giving people uh, money, you know, in, in, in digital money in, in their bank accounts. Um, this is another debate. But these are all practical debates about building socialism. They are not having abstract debates necessarily about the nature of, of Marxist theory in, in abstraction. They are trying to understand practically uh, how to build socialism in the world. In other words, they've taken essentially um, the very best of Marxism and they brought it into conflict with the, um, the kind of constraints that exist upon them in elaborating a, a communist society or a socialist process. So that's the nature of the debates. You know, there, these are practical debates uh, about how much, you know, pain can, can a country tolerate? Um, you know, whether zero COVID is actually good for a society. These are the debates that actual Marxists are happening in China. They are not having debates around questions of, you know, authoritarianism because the term authoritarianism is not actually a theoretically good term. It's an ideological term. Um, you know, what does authoritarianism mean? Does it mean that, say, Xi Jinping is in charge and whatever Xi Jinping does happens and is done by 1.4 billion people? Look, that is just simply not possible in a society of that scale. One person simply can't control everything. There has to be many mediations and so on. So the term authoritarianism, that's just a term that I think people on the center left or whatever have debates outside China. Inside China, that's not a debate. Inside China, there is a debate about what is uh, what is adequate uh, as a boundary for speech you know what kind of speech is acceptable what kind of speech is not acceptable i think this is a perfectly good thing to have social debates and discussions about um, you know this is the kind of discussion that took place in cuba around the question of religion in the early period of the revolution um, essentially the the cuban revolution took a path that looked like it was promoting atheism then, after several decades of experience, um, the Cuban, the Communist Party in Cuba decided, well, that's not exactly the best way to go. And they brought in um, the question of religion for discussion, liberation, theology, and so on. So, you know, when we talk about a communist or a socialist project, when Marxists inside that project are deliberating and discussing, they have to actually discuss practical application of the theory. And I find that quite exciting. You know, again, they are not discussing the nature of humanity and so on. Uh, that's because they have gripping problems before them. How to end hunger, how to educate everybody, how to eradicate poverty, how to advance the productive forces in a way that doesn't create social inequalities. It's a big debate in China around what was done in the 1990s, where advancing the productive forces increased social inequalities, where it created a capitalist class, how to now roll that back, you know, how to use, say, the lever of anti-corruption uh, to basically move against the law of value of capitalism that has been set in place in China. Every time they, they go after a high official for corruption, what they're sending is a message to the private sector saying, look, you know, you're not allowed to go that far away from the social basis of our society. This is a journey. Socialism is a journey. And that's precisely what I think is exciting about the Marxist debates happening in places like China and Cuba today. I think that's wonderfully said. Um, I was particularly interested. You mentioned Cheng and Fu describes himself as a creative Marxist. Um, and I'm wondering if there's any ties to the 60s, uh, Lomonosov University School of Creative Marxism in the Soviet Union, because that's part of what my, my work uh, centers on. 
Um, but to roll into the next question, in some of your work, you've talked about the four left waves which have arisen out of Latin America. Today, we find a hemisphere where Lula advances into the second round with favorable poll numbers, where the Petro Marquez victory in Colombia advances the struggle of popular forces in the country, reestablishing ties with Venezuela and condemning U.S. NATO warmongering and environmental destruction, and where Mexico, Bolivia, Honduras, and the CARICOM countries stand up consistently against U.S. attacks on what the empire has labeled as the Troika of tyranny, Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua, all countries which, of course, have their popular masses in power and have challenged for decades the capturing of their sovereignty by the U.S. empire. In this context of both a leftward shift in the region, but of also a more general unity of La Patria Grande, can you talk a bit about what makes this fourth wave different from the former ones? How did the previous ones lay the ground for it? How does the crisis the U.S. empire is facing in light of a resurgent multipolar world intensify the influence and potential of this recent fourth wave? You see, Carlos, let's put it this way. You know, Cuba today has a population of about 11 million people. It's a very small island, very small population in comparison to the world population, 7.9 billion. And yet, remarkably, in 1959, when the Cuban revolution took place, it shook the world, you know, not, not just the island of Cuba, it shook the world. And if we want, we can come back to that. But let's just stay with Latin America. It shook Latin America. And yes, there have been four waves of um, revolutionary developments since the Cuban revolution. Of course, there were waves prior to that. There's the great Mexican revolution of 1911 and so on. I, I'm not going to discuss that because the modern impact of these revolutionary waves emanates out of Cuba, 1959, not really out of the Mexican Revolution, although, of course, there's continuity. So let's just start from 1959. The first major wave out of Cuba was a kind of Guevaraist strategy of creating revolutions across the hemisphere. Um, and that you know includes, for instance, Hector Bihar leading a political force in Peru. It includes Douglas Bravo with the Focos in, in, in Venezuela. It includes various groupings all across the, the continent, including in most of the Central American countries. Well, these um, developments were smashed by the use by the United States of sending the military out of the barracks in almost all of these countries. From Brazil in 1964, that coup that lasted 21 years, out to the coup against the people of Chile. We began with Victor Hara. Victor Hara next year, 50 years since his murder, his assassination, but also 50 years since the coup in 1973 against the popular unity government of Salvador Allende. So the first phase of counter-revolution was setting in play uh, militaries out of the barracks, including through a project known as Project Condor, uh, Operation Condor, to go after the Guevaraists um, that you know were inspired by the Cuban Revolution. That was the first wave. The second wave develops in the 1970s, two emblematic events, the Nicaraguan Revolution of 79 and the New Jewel Movement and Revolution in Grenada in 1979. Well, the reaction to these movements was direct military intervention by the United States. No more really reliance on getting militaries such as in Brazil or in Argentina to leave the barracks. Now the U.S. just comes in and builds whether they invade Grenada as they did under Ronald Reagan or they have proxy armies built like the Contras and others in Central America to come in and essentially... Uh, militarily uh, campaign, they, they allowed societies to be plunged into civil war in order to destroy the second revolutionary wave. And that's the wave that goes right into El Salvador, breaking that society, Guatemala, with horrendous human rights abuses and so on. But it does, in some to some extent, constrain the revolutionary wave. It's held in Nicaragua, but it's constrained in other places, including in El Salvador. The third wave opens up in the late 1980s when Hugo Chavez uh, develops a strategy after having attempted a coup d'etat. He develops a, a electoral strategy in the 1990s and wins a magnificent victory 
1998 in Venezuela and opens up this Bolivarian regional project. Now, uh, because of high commodity prices, as the United States distracted by its uh, illegal wars in the Middle East, and particularly in Iraq, a space opens up in Latin America for the Bolivarian project to articulate itself. As I said, high commodity prices helps. This is also the period when Lula is in power in Brazil, Lula one, Lula two. There is a gap between Chavez and Lula in this era, but certainly it's quite an interesting development, this second phase, the, sorry, this third phase. This third phase is, is attacked in a new counter-revolutionary wave which uh, included the collapse in commodity prices, a kind of hybrid war against Venezuela's intensified illegal unilateral sanctions, lawfare against Lula, legislative fair against uh, Dilma, lawfare against the government of Lugo in Paraguay, and so on and so forth. That was the counter-revolution to that um, third wave. Now the situation is changed. Now we are in a situation where mass movements as a consequence of the counter-revolutionary developments in the third phase, as a consequence of the collapsed commodity prices, um, as a consequence of the pandemic and so on, people's movements are fragmented in many parts of, of South America and Central America. And what you have now is the possibility, the maximum possibility of social democratic or center left forces coming to power. There's no surprise, therefore, that you're going to get, say, a Gabriel Boric come to power in Chile, very narrow um, you know, uh, agenda, but also a very narrow uh, frame of possibilities for any government that comes to power there. We're seeing that across the border in Argentina, great convulsion within the ranks of the ruling alliance between, say, the center left or the left Peronists who are with Christina Kirchner, and then the more right section with Alberto Fernandez. But you also have surprises. You know, the surprise victory of Gustavo Petro and Francia Marquez in Colombia is something to behold. A wretched oligarchy in that country has not had a left or even center left or even liberal government since 1810 when Colombia was founded. And here comes Petro and Marquez, and they're doing a very good job moving as much of an agenda as is possible, um, including, as you say, normalizing relations with Venezuela, but much more than that, uh, trying to complete the peace process, not only with the FARC, which was already completed in the Havana Accords, but now with the ELN. So we are in a new period where even Lula is much more radical than he was in the 2000s. He likely will win on October the 30th. Brazil is a very conservative country. So you can't expect a lot. The Congress is going to be controlled by the right, the so-called Centrao. They'll control the Congress, but Lula is going to move a regional agenda. So, you know, as Marxists, we have to pay attention to what Marx and Engels wrote in the German ideology. They said communism is the real movement of history. It's not a fantasy. You know, you can't bring communism from your head into the world. You have to bring communism from struggles dealing with the actual realities in the world, create an actual movement in the world and establish our ideas through our struggles, not just, you know, put our ideas from our heads. It doesn't work like that. Um, and therefore, we need to be extraordinarily, um, you know, training each other in political education, in the nature of struggles, trying to understand the limits to political work. You know, I'm not in the world of shopping where I say, I, you know, Boric is not great. Somebody is better and so on. That's not a good way to understand politics. One has to understand what is possible. What is somebody able to move an agenda beyond what's possible? What could happen? How is the most effective way to do critique and so on? You've got to have a method in how we assess these governments, not just a matter of, you know, taste. I have an ideal type socialist and then I measure actual existing socialist based on an ideal type. That's idealism, friends. We are not idealists. We are materialists. We have to understand the real movement of history. I love it. That was a great answer. Um, when you talked about the way that the Cuban Revolution uh, shook the world and, and opened the path for struggle um, in other countries to advance, it reminded me of the, the Haitian Revolution, um, 1791 to 1804. 
uh, which seriously weakened the French and, and changed the geopolitical system at the time. And it shows how once, you know, the, the system of production becomes globalized, uh, the struggle is inherently international then because um, the struggle in one country uh, is going to affect the geopolitical situation overall. Um, so I'll move on to the next question, though. Um, speaking of the international struggle, um, in the end of 2020, more than 250 million Indian farmers and workers recorded the largest strike in human history. Um, this was an event which, of course, received no serious coverage in the Western media. Can you speak a bit about the state of class struggle in India? From the perspective of an outsider, it seems that the communists in India have been a lot better at integrating themselves with the various socialist organizations and worker and farmer unions in the country uh, than we have in the U.S., where the relations between socialist organizations seems to be more one of exclusion than unification or coalition building. Um, so what role do the communist parties in India play in political life? And what can U.S. communists take away from the incredible successful examples of communist governments, such governance, such as those in uh, Kerala? So, you know, Eddie, that's a great question. And I, I'm happy to talk about the farmers. I could go on at great length, but I want to be a little uh, careful of how I explain this. You know, there are two um, authors, let's say, to this struggle, the great farmers revolt, let's say, the Kisan commune. Uh, there are two authors to this. There are actually two authors to all struggles. One is more objective factors and the other is subjective. Let's take them in turn. In terms of the objective factors, I mean, you know, after the Indian economy was opened up uh, to what's called liberalization, neoliberalism and so on, um, the condition of farming life was under attack. You know, agrarian credit structures were broken. Um, the government sort of pushed farmers to intensify production with more fertilizers, uh, more uh, pesticides and so on, uh, to try to intensify production to increase yields with different kinds of seeds and so on and so forth. This made farming very expensive. And many farmers went into a, you know immense debt. The debt crisis for farmers in the 1990s significant. Now, my uh, colleague at Tricontinental, my friend and the great journalist P. Sainath, uh, he uncovered in the early 2000s that in about a decade or so, maybe 15 years, um, almost a third of a million Indian farmers committed suicide. The immediate reaction to the deteriorating objective conditions was self-harm. Uh, by the way, you know, Sainath and I looked at the situation in the United States. And after the collapse of small farms in the U.S. in the 1980s, you might remember um, Willie Nelson started the Farm Aid Project to try to help farmers. In fact, from that time onward, there was a kind of self-harm that is inflicted upon farming communities. Um, this self-harm comes in two different ways. One, there were very high rates of both suicide and murder in farming communities. You know, I wrote a story about a family in Iowa where the farmer comes back from the bank, takes his gun, shoots his entire family and shoots himself. This was called a mass killing. In fact, it's a collective suicide as a consequence of the farmer's um, crisis. The other, of course, is the entry of crystal meth into farming communities to substitute for farming. Also a form of self-harm because those communities were racked. They were destroyed by the entry of, entry of crystal meth. Um, so the objective factors produced a really desolate situation for Indian farmers in the 90s and early 2000s. And then in comes, fascinatingly, um, you know, the farmers movement. Now, it has taken generations to build the farmers movement in India. The All India Kisan Sabha was founded in 1936 by the communists. Communists have been building the All India Kisan Sabha for decades working in struggles all across the country. In particular, in Maharashtra, a few years ago, uh, the All India Kisan Sabha organized a mass march of farmers. Maharashtra was hard hit by drought, hard hit by collapsing commodity prices and so on. Farmers uh, there went on a long march from Nasik into Bombay. This was an enormous event. It was covered by the media, particularly when the farmers entered Bombay they were informed that the next day there was going to be an, an examination for students. 
um, and that their farm was going to disrupt this important exam for students. So the farmer leaders took a decision that they'd march all night so as not to disrupt the students. This earned them an enormous amount of goodwill from the middle class in the cities. It also built up a kind of sentiment among farmers that they can win because they did win some gains in that struggle in Maharashtra. There was another struggle in Rajasthan. Again, farmers went on a general strike and they won gains from that state government. Well, when Mr. Modi decided to go put the whip against farmers with three farm bills, uh, two things happened. One is the objective condition of farming was already deteriorating, already in a terrible state, and they simply didn't want to see the uberization of farm life. They did not want to allow that. And subjectively, the victories in Maharashtra, the victories in Rajasthan, the work of the All India Kisan Sabha, the farmers union, which is built and developed by the communists, their communist links with community organizations, with other farmers groups and so on, they gathered together and they conducted this major farm strike and they made Mr. Modi withdraw those farm bills. One of the few political defeats suffered by Modi. But here I want to caution things. We in the left are very good at building these struggles, winning essentially this battle in the class struggle or that battle in the class struggle. But comrades, here's the difficulty. Shortly after the victory, there was an election in the state of Uttar Pradesh, the largest state in India. Some 250 million people live in that state. It is a base area for the Hindu far right of Mr. Narendra Modi, the Prime Minister of India. It's a real base for him. And it's, as I said, it's the largest state in India. Well, the entire western part of that state participated one way or the other in the farmer's struggle. But after the struggle had been won, farmers went back home and they re-elected the party of Mr. Modi to governance. Now, I have personally had this experience before in 1989 while canvassing for my comrade Subhashini Ali under the red flag, the communist flag, to be a member of parliament in the town of Kanpur, which is a working class town. I remember going from um, you know, house to house in these working class mill areas where farmers would tell us, listen, comrade, uh, sorry, factory workers would tell us, listen, comrade, we are with you when it comes to strikes. We are with you in the workplace, but we're going to vote for the Congress when it comes to elections because they give us electricity connections. They give us water and so on, the kind of patron client money relationship of democracy. We have to have a serious discussion about how bourgeois democracy is so inflicted with money that even if we build mass capacity in major struggles, to translate that into a political victory is very difficult. By political, I mean an electoral victory. It's very difficult. We have to come to terms with that. You know, bourgeois democracy serves a penalty against the bulk of people, even when they are organized and winning mass struggles, they are penalized when it comes to uh, bourgeois democratic elections. And that's what is part of the unfortunate experience of the farmer struggle. Well, I could sit here and talk about the farming struggle for hours and hours, especially with how important it is right now concerning the plans of the WEF and all that. Um, but for the moment, let's just shift over to the U.S., uh, we seem to be entering here a, a period of intensified radicalization in the 2020s. Everywhere you look, everyone is questioning capitalism, questioning war, questioning really what our ruling class even tells us reality is. Um, excuse me. So often, though, they end up sort of missing the mark or just coming up with radical sounding ways to support imperialist organizations like the Democratic Party. Uh, and things like that. So my question to you is really, what's up with that? <laughs> um, how do we take what seems like an almost automatic right opportunism into a more progressive direction with more than just voting for Democrats as the ultimate end result, even of street actions? You know, it's really interesting to see this. And I wrote to, I think, Eddie, uh, maybe a year or so ago, saying I was very happy to encounter the work you're doing at Midwestern Marxism and so on, that, you know, the fact that 
Midwestern Marx exists and that people are having these discussions and debate and so on gives me a great sense of, uh, of, of joy, you know, because it's wonderful to see people having these discussions. Again, there's an objective reason for it. I mean, you know, the mainstream economists say in places like the United States, that earlier dream that children of, uh, of families will have a better standard of living than their parents that dream has gone a generation ago, you know, before you, it has, it had already withered. Um, but now it's becoming clearer and clearer to families that people are convulsed, bathed in debt, uh, unable to really exercise any kind of, of dream or an American dream and so on, that this debt crisis has been a severe infliction for people, you know, that college debt over a trillion dollars, uh, total college debt in the United States is incredible. Um, and so people objectively are feeling the problems. Look at the state of work these days. I mean, look at the state of work. What does it mean to work as in the delivery business or to work at Amazon or even to have a middle management job? The conditions of work are so abysmal that there has been some sort of searching for alternatives. And secondly, I, I do feel that the, the impact of the campaign of Bernie Sanders was significant. Um, now, I may not agree with Mr. Sanders on everything, but he certainly ran an, an impressive campaign where he talked about the practical possibilities of some kind of socialism in the United States. He put on the table the fact that education need not be um, commodified, that you could have education be an entity that comes out of the social wealth. You know, you can have higher education institutions. You don't have to commodify that. He put on the table the possibility of having public transportation decommodified. I mean, all of this is important. It started a conversation and it radicalized. You know, that's what often happens. Out of the Bernie period, you got the emergence of the Democratic Socialists of America. You got to pay attention to the fact that all these discussions, all these developments are taking place without a historical link uh, to past, um, you know, communist or left-wing uh, traditions in the United States because those forces had been deeply weakened and were not able to influence these developments. So you're going to have all kinds of chaotic things happening. People are like magpies drawing ideas from here, there, everywhere. That's why you see in the DSA a range of opinions um, that exist and so on. You know, I just think this process must be accompanied. Let's see where it goes. Let's try to provide some sort of intellectual discussion here. You know, let's try to uh, give people new things to read. Let's try to deepen their assessment of, of what they're understanding, deepen their, their own struggles that they're involved in and so on. So that, for instance, this wave of struggles in Amazon and Starbucks and, and whatnot, don't once again be hegemonized by the kind of business unionism of the AFL-CIO, but they have a different kind of progressive socialist direction, perhaps more oriented to the communities, um, you know, th th that in which they live and, and so on and so forth. So, I mean, in that sense, all I can say is that I think it's it's for reasons of the deterioration of life in places like the United States, but also it had to do with this subjective, you know, factor, which is the campaign of Mr. Sanders, the, the you know, the kind of development of these new groups. And I would say to, to you, I mean, in the Institute, you play an important role because you are able to, in, in a sense, amplify new debates and, and dialogues uh, with people who are being radicalized and brought into the movement. Um, it's silly to assume that people enter these, these movements, become part of these forces fully formed. You know, uh, come on. You know, when I was young, I, I, I came into the left without having read anything. Um, I came into the left through the protest movements, through struggles, getting involved in the student movement and things. I later read books. I didn't read the books and then come to struggles. Very few people do that. Most people come the other way around. I was far more interested in punk rock music than I was in, you know, Karl Marx. Uh, later, I understood the importance of reading Marx and so on. Um, you know, for me, radicalism came from you know, a lot of it was from California punk rock, you know, from the dead Kennedys and so on. Uh, that's where I got my radicalism. Later, I read Marx and got more serious about the battle of ideas and so on. You are at an advanced position in a platform like Midwestern Marx. You can provide people with 
direction that might interest them and might amplify and stimulate new kinds of debates and discussions. I think that's wonderfully said. And, and just real quick, before we hop on to the next question, one of the things you mentioned uh, with the emergence of the Bernie movement was that there was no historical link to a past American socialist struggle or struggle of the popular forces. And that's one of the things that we have been really fighting against since the inception of our project, this conception that on the one hand, you have the U.S. and the American working people. On the other hand, you have socialism. And there's this unbridgeable gap between the two because that's all that's very, very false. You know, one of the things that we have been doing in a part of our project, um, that's uh, the Journal of American Socialist Studies, is showing how even from the beginning of the 19th century, very Marxist like theories have been developing from the American socialist struggle before Marx, two, three decades before Marx and Engels ever wrote anything of significance in the mid 40s. And so I, I think this is such an important part of our struggle today. Having those historical linkages would show that the struggle we are waging on today is waged on historical legs and that there have been people before us that have waged it, that have died waging them, that have faced imprisonment and repression of various forms in order to bring about a socialist USA. So. Yeah, and when you talk about the radicalization of Bernie um, or, or the radicalization of a lot of people who were drawn to politics by Bernie, um, I think practically we've been trying to push people to just raise the property question, you know, go to protests, go to places people are organizing and um, raise the question of property and of socialism and, and uh, point the critique at capitalism. Um, and Carlos and I were both uh, heavily involved in the Bernie campaign and, you know, saw a lot of people who were able to to radicalize out of that. Um, so, yeah, I guess that leads us into our last question then. Uh, I think one of your most memorable lines of yours that we're constantly referring back to um, is you live on the other side of imperialism, which was a reply um, to a comradely exchange with Professor David Harvey in light of an American left which buys into the lies of empire, whether related to Cuba, China or Russia. Uh, what role do you think living on our side of imperialism has played in developing these forms of compatible Marxism or compatible leftism, which always seem to oppose the construction of socialism abroad and to parrot State Department talking points about any project struggling against imperialism? Well, look, I, I have great respect for David Harvey and for all his contribution to Marxism and so on. Um, but I, when I did read the book that we were talking about that day, I was actually surprised by his assertion about the end of imperialism. Um, and I think the factor that he was looking at was quite reductive, which is that um, investment flows had switched direction. You know, that if you're getting investment, say, from India coming to Europe, then, well, there's no more imperialism. Well, then maybe India is imperialist. I thought that was a little reductive. The question of imperialism can't just be... Um, restricted to, you know, the direction of investment flows, foreign direct investment, that, that's not the best metric. Anyway, um, look, you know, the question of which side you are on is not as relevant as what you're doing, you know. I mean, that to me is the main issue. Um, right now, uh, the island of Cuba has just been struck by Hurricane Ian. Situation is grim. The electricity grid is in trouble and so on. The U.S. government under Biden... Um, not only is maintaining the normal uh, blockade of Cuba, the normal blockade set up in the 1960s, but is actually also maintaining the, ex the kind of intensified blockade put in place by Donald Trump. 243 measures of sanctions. They've maintained Cuba on the state uh, sponsor of terrorism list. All of this makes if life in Cuba difficult, makes it difficult for Cuba to do normal commerce and trade. These are all illegal sanctions, by the way. They don't have any uh, validity in international law, anything like that. But the U.S. is essentially throttling Cuba. Now, if you live in the United States, I would say a principal place uh, of action is to get the U.S. government to at least remove Cuba from the state sponsors of terrorism list. This struggle against the throttling of Cuba is a great place for young people to develop an understanding of imperialism. I mean, Cuba is only 11 million people. It exports doctors, for God's sake. It doesn't export terrorists. You want to put a country on the state sponsor of terrorist list? Put Saudi Arabia on that list. After all, those who attacked the U.S. 
in 9-11, most of them were Saudis. But Saudi Arabia is not on that list. Cuba is on the list. Cuba, which sends doctors all over the world and has given its five vaccines for COVID basically free uh, to anybody outside the world. So this is a great example uh, to see what the actual reality of imperialism. There's no other way to understand U.S. policy regarding Cuba than through the framework of imperialism. There's no kind of liberal explanation for this. You've got to have a much harder explanation, which is the Marxist explanation of imperialism. And if that's the case, well, building struggles to defend the rights of the Cuban people to have sovereignty and dignity, I think that's a, a tremendous way to build a, a new kind of, of left energy in the U.S. That's broke, that will break from the tired debates that had been there for a century, um, you know, about like whether, you know, a socialist country is actually socialist or is it state capitalist? I mean, those dead, boring debates, you know, has China restored capitalism? For God's sake, grow up, guys. We have a world to win. We don't have a world to define. You know, the point isn't to have a more accurate definition based on your premises. The point is to win the world. And you're not going to win the world by having those kind of debates. You know, right now, if you are a person on the left inside the United States, I think building pressure on the U.S. state uh, to stop the war against Cuba, I think is a key part of, of, of your own practice of building, amplifying, strengthening your own political um, uh, of will. You know, one of the limitations of the uh, campaign of Bernie Sanders is it completely ignored foreign policy. And therefore, you then get these kind of post-Bernie politicians like AOC who have no clue when it comes to things happening ar around the world. You often see them say rather shallow things about places around the world. You've got to bring a consideration of the U.S. government's foreign interventions and so on into the emerging socialist current in the United States. Otherwise, it'll become a kind of socialist imperialism. And, you know, the world just can't afford that. I think that's wonderfully said. Um, I, I was wondering if you had time for just one short more question. Um, so we recently saw the 20th Congress of the Communist Party of China, uh, where Xi Jinping affirmed that our experience has taught us that at the fundamental level, uh, we owe the success of our party and socialism with Chinese characteristics to the fact that Marxism works. Um, and I think that's a very different spirit from the Marxism that you find in the West. That's, as you mentioned, pessimistic, but also divided, uh, separated from, from any sort of revolutionary praxis. Um, in the context of a decaying empire, like the one that we have today, um, which has, it, it, it seems like it's continuously failing to um, to in, in its proxy wars, whether against Russia, against China, in Latin America. Um, what do you think uh, the future looks like for the current geopolitical arena that we're in? Because it seems like the folks leading the U.S. are okay with collective nuclear destruction insofar as it means they can try to continue uh, securing their global imperialist hegemony. So what do you think? Well, look, I don't want to end with anything quite gloomy, but certainly um, I agree with Chomsky that um, the U.S. ruling class is a wretched ruling class that's willing to destroy the Earth system uh, to maintain its power. I think that's, you know, you don't need, that's a fact. You, this is not a, a statement I'm making that's not a fact. Um, you know, they deny climate change, for instance, almost totally. Um, you know, uh, they are refusing to, uh, enter into arms control talks with the Russians and with the Chinese and so on and so forth. I mean, this is a really destructive ruling class. But because it's so destructive and because it's so uh, empty of ideas, you know, vacuous, mediocre ruling class, mediocre politicians, because of that, it opens a lane for bright young people like yourselves to go out there and articulate uh, better ideas, uh, germinate new kinds of struggles and so on. I mean, now Mr. Biden has said that his government wants to end hunger in the United States. Now, you know, after China has already uh, abolished absolute poverty, now the United States says we are interested in abolishing hunger. How are they going to do it with more um, NGO privatized forms of charity? It's not going to work like that. You know, it doesn't work like that. The Chinese have actually proved in practice 
that you've got to create social transfer payments. You've got to create more public goods. You've got to create at a minimum a public health care system, you know, an infrastructure that takes care of people. You've got to create um, a system of generating uh, food production near where people live and where people are able to get food uh, perhaps in a public system where prices are one one way or the other controlled, you know, these are elementary things that the Chinese have actually proved. At Tricontinental, we did a report on the abolition of absolute poverty. It's worth looking at that report because it's it's not like some you know ideological statement. We look practically at what they have done. And I would like to send a copy to Mr. Biden. You're interested in, in eradicating hunger in the United States? Go and study what the Brazilians did under Lula with Fome Zero, Zero Hunger, that policy for which... Brazil won a prize from the United Nations. Um, subsequent to the rise of Temer and then Bolsonaro, hunger rates have gone very high in Brazil. Go and have a look at what the Brazilians have done. Take a lesson from the Chinese. That's what I would say to Mr. Biden. But, you know, they are mediocre leaders. They don't want to look at these things. But you must. You must go among the people. You must share these ideas, you know. Um, you know, you must come with the world into the United States. I think uh, it's been too long that people in the United States believe they have the answers to everything. I think now people in the United States need to acknowledge that they merely live on the planet Earth as part of a community of nations. And as much as we can learn things from the United States, the United States can learn things from other countries. And on this, they can certainly learn a thing or two from the Chinese. Well, speaking of learning things from other countries, we learned so much from you. Uh, and I just want to thank you so much from all of us just for coming on today. It's been a pleasure. It's my pleasure. And thanks for doing everything you do. You are all wonderful. And I enjoy I'm, I'm looking forward very much to reading the books you have published. Congratulations again. Thank you, comrade. Thank you. It's an yeah, honor to meet you on. Your, your work has been extremely formative for all of us. Agreed. Yeah, that means a ton to all of us. Um, your books kind of <laughs> are part of what got us all into, into all of this. So thank you. Okay, take care of yourselves. Take care. Thank See you, everyone. Bye. Thanks for watching. Bye. Bye, Bye everybody.